Well, today we're in week three of a five-week series on the book of Genesis. Our goal is in the next couple of years to walk through the entire book of Genesis, but we're going to do it at four or five weeks at a time. So in this one, we're covering creation through the fall and the flood. Then we'll come back early 2020, start with Abraham, and continue to, um, to work through this book. I've said this, I'll say it again. If you want to understand the world you live in today, you better understand the first three chapters of the book of Genesis because it explains so much about the world that we live in today. Kind of recap, uh, Moses wrote this book under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God gave the words. Moses held the pen. Moses wrote, wrote about things he would have no idea about, but God led him to write these words. He wrote them as he was leading the Israelites out of captivity in Egypt into the promised land. So it's almost as if God is saying, okay, uh, you know where you're going. Let me remind you where you came from. And the Israelite story, Moses' story, the story of Genesis is all of our story. And so Moses writes about it. We looked at the first two weeks that God created everything in five days, said it was good, created man in the six days, said, boy, now this is very good. The Hebrew word there is mahod, which is a word that expresses far more than we can in the English language by just saying very good. It really is very, very excellent, off the top, great good. I mean, that's, that it's, it's expressed a very powerful good. And in that, what God is saying is that all creation is created by God, but that man is the ultimate of God's creation, and man is to manage and to, uh, to manage and to work God's creation. He puts Adam and Eve in the garden, and he says, everything's here, and last week we left with paradise. Adam and Eve are in the garden. It's paradise. Well, we look at that image, and then we look at the world today, and most of us, whether we embrace Christianity or not, would have to say something is not right with the world. We watch the news, and we see of wars that are going on, and we see of, of people who take other people's lives. We see of those who abuse others, and we see the atrocities that are going on in the world. And especially today, we look at our nation, and we go, man, uh, just things are crazy in our nation, all that's going on. The things that, that people are embracing and, and saying are good. And, and we look at our nation and we think, how did it ever get like this? And I know that we have a lot of theories, right? For some, man, it's the breakdown of the family. The reason why the incarceration rate is so high, the reason why we've got what's going on in our culture is because of the breakdown in the family, and that's a result. And other people would say, you know, it's because of an ungodly government who's trying to deconstruct one nation under God and reconstruct it in a nation where God has no, um, no place in that nation. Others would go, no, it's the universities, it's the colleges who have for years have been teaching some really crazy things and indoctrinating the next generation. And right now we're just reaping what we've sowed over the years and years. And everybody has a theory about what's wrong with the world. But if we're truly honest, and I know this is church, it's a hard place to be honest, but if we're truly honest, We'd have to say, yeah, but there's also something wrong with me. Am I the only one who have said something in the moment I say it? I go, that was stupid. <laughs> I should have, how, why did I say that? You know, where did that come from? And we, we maybe, it's, maybe it's where, you know, you gossip about somebody and say something that, that you shouldn't have said. Maybe it's... Um, out of anger, you have this outburst, or maybe it's something inappropriate to the opposite sex, or, or maybe, you know, it's that you really just say something and, and you feel so embarrassed about it, and you think, man, that's not me. Where did that come from? And today, I contend that maybe that is you. Maybe that is me. And maybe that's the best reflection of who we really are as opposed to those times we can control our tongue. 
And I know that we all have a reason why we think that we've lost it and, and all, and we have all kind of excuses. Well, the reason I have an anger issue is because I grew up in a house where my parents were angry. They were always yelling at each other. I just learned that, and that's the way that I am. Or maybe it's because I just never felt loved and I do the crazy things I do because I need to feel love and affection. Or I'm in a loveless marriage and, and if my spouse actually loved me, then I wouldn't act this way. Or, or that, just quite honestly, that person deserved it. If they don't want me calling them a jerk, they need to quit acting like a jerk. And, and we have all of these excuses on why we are the way that we are. And we need excuses because it's not the way we know it should be. And today what we're gonna look at is that the Bible gives us the ultimate reason why not only the world's a mess, but why we're a mess. And it came by one action, by one man that has affected all of us. And again, if we don't understand this story, then we'll really not understand the world that we live in today. In Genesis chapter 3, we have what I believe is the darkest day in history. You know, many times when we are on Good Friday and we talk about Jesus being on the cross, that that was the darkest day in history. But the truth is, if it wasn't for this day in Genesis 3, Jesus wouldn't have had to go to the cross. The reason Jesus had to go to the cross was because of what happened in the verses, the few verses that we're going to read this morning. And so God has created paradise. He's put Adam and Eve in paradise. They're naked and unashamed, and that goes far beyond the physical. It really means that they're totally uh, exposed and open to each other. There's nothing to hide between each other or even between them and God. And they're in this perfect paradise. And God said, out of my love, I created this for you. It's all yours. Here's how you show your love for me. Stay away or don't eat of the fruit of this one tree. And I've had people say, well, Chuck, if God knew that they were going to take of the tree because he knows everything, and if he knew at that point it was going to cost him his son, why would he even give them the option? Why even give them the option to say and the truth is because without a choice, there is no love. Love requires a choice. You choose every day whether you're going to love your spouse or not. You choose every day to what extent you're going to love your children or your parents. Love requires a choice. Think about it this way. If, if a marriage is a, an arranged marriage and you're forced to marry somebody out of this arrangement, then marriage is not built on love because there was no choice. Now, you can learn to love as you choose to love each other, but love always requires a choice. And so God puts them in the garden, says, here's the only choice I'm asking you to make. To show your love for me, don't eat from this one tree. And yet when we pick up the story today, look, we know the Garden of Eden, we don't know its dimensions, but we know it was pretty big because we know the rivers that flowed through it. We know where two of them are today. And so we know where it was, Iraq, Kuwait. And so it was probably, the garden was probably a pretty big place. But as we pick up the story today, Satan finds Adam and Eve hanging out in the only place they could get in trouble. And that is right by the tree. So we pick it up in chapter three, verse one. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from the tree in the garden? Now, a lot of stuff here. Right? First of all, when you look at the serpent, understand this, that what's going on here, and we'll find out later, that Satan has entered into a serpent, and he's speaking to Eve. And apparently Eve's okay with that which begs a lot of questions that I don't have answers for, right? Like, did animals speak before the fall? Uh, you know, I mean, how in the world can this serpent be talking to Eve and she's okay with that? But she apparently is. And notice that Satan, through the serpent, is already setting Eve up, saying, did God tell you you can't eat from any of those trees? 
The one thing that Satan wants to do is distort the word of God. And look at how Eve responded in verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit in the tree of the middle of the garden, God said, You must not eat it or touch it, or you will die. So now Satan has already kind of set her up, and now she's distorting God's word. Because God said, don't eat it, but he never said, don't touch it. And so she's adding to God's word. Now, let me just, I mentioned last week, I grew up in Illinois as a, as a kid, we had an apple orchard. Let me defend apples for just a second, okay? The fruit in the garden probably was not an apple. We don't know what it was, but it probably wasn't an apple. I don't know how the apple got the bad rap to be the fruit in the garden. In fact, here's what I believe. I believe that whatever fruit it was in the garden doesn't exist anymore. It was fruit on a tree called the knowledge of good and evil. Why would God put that tree out there anymore, right, after he closed up the garden? So probably that fruit doesn't even exist anymore. But, but Eve said, yeah, we can't eat from that tree. Now look at verse 4. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat, uh, eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And in that verse, you get Satan's agenda. Here's what Satan was telling Eve. God's holding out on you. God is holding out on you. Because he knows if you take of that, you're going to be like him. And there's things that he doesn't want you to experience. And so he's holding out on you. Which, by the way, Satan's lies are always half-truths. And there were things that God didn't want Adam and Eve to experience. Things like guilt and shame and hurt. And today we're talking about pain. But Satan still uses that lie, and we still fall for it. Did God really say, um, remain sexually pure until you're married? Oh, well, God couldn't really mean that. I mean, it, you know, everybody's doing it, and, and what's the big deal? And in other words, God's holding out on me if he wants me to say sexually pure until I get married. Uh, did God really say, don't chase after materialism, but seek him first? Satan's lies, no, it's in the things of this world you're going to find happiness and joy, so you really need to do everything you can to get as much as you can, as long as you can. And we buy into the lie over and over and over again. Do you really need to set the alarm and get up and go to church and get in a small group and, and give of your time, your talents, and your treasures? Look at everybody else. They seem happy, and they don't do that. We buy the lie. And so Satan tells Eve, listen, God's really holding out on you. Now, it doesn't say this in Scripture, but here's what I believe happened. First of all, we believe that Satan probably had arms, legs, feet, and hands before this. Okay, so while he's in the garden, not only is he talking, but he's walking around. And I believe, in, even though it doesn't say in Scripture, I believe Satan took some of the fruit and took a big old bite. And after he took a bite, he looked at Eve and said, See, you're not going to die. And just held that fruit up there in front of, of Eve. Why do I believe that? Because of the next, uh, the next verse. First of all, verse 4, he said, No, you're not going to die. I think he did that ap said that after he took a bite. And here's why I believe that. Look in verse 6. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for attain, obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. I believe she looked at Satan and said, you know what? He just took a bite and he didn't die. So apparently what he's saying is true and God doesn't know what he's talking about and God really is holding out on me. What Eve didn't understand is there are two types of death. There's a spiritual death and a, there's a physical death. And what 
Eve didn't understand was the moment she took of that fruit, she died spiritually. That her relationship with God, her intimacy with God was totally broken and fractured because of sin. And that she was going to start to die physically at that moment. But because she believed the lie and she was caught in Satan's trap, she took of the fruit and ate it. And not only did she do that, but then it says she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then, now, after they ate it, now they see the results of it. The eyes of both of them were open and they knew they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. The moment Adam and Eve took of that fruit, they died spiritually. Their relationship with God was broken, and they started to die physically. They would get old and die. And yes, now they're going to experience some things that God never intended for them to experience. They're experiencing pain. They're experiencing hurt. They're experiencing shame all things that came because of the fall, because they turned their backs on God and believed the lie of Satan. And as we look at this story, understand that God never calls it the sin of Eve. That bothered me for a long time. Come on, God, it was the woman who did it, right? Why are you blaming Adam when it was the woman? who? In fact, she's the one who gave it to him. Well, the Bible is very clear on this. Eve was deceived. Adam knew exactly what he was doing. And it's the sin of Adam. But here's what I want us to know. It's not just the sin of Adam. It's the sin of all of us. That we have all fallen into that trap, listened to the lie, and done the same thing. And because of that, there is pain in this world. In your notes, let's look at the consequences of Adam's choice uh, in this life, pain. First of all, pain in his own life. Pain in his own life. Look at this verse, um, uh, Genesis 5-3. Adam was 130 years old when he fathered a son in his likeness according to his image and named him Seth. Here's what's interesting about this verse. What's telling about, about this verse? God's going to create, and he says, let us make man in our image. God was made in the image of God. I mean, Adam was made in the image of God. But look at what it says here. Seth was made in the image of Adam. What's that about? Well, here's God. what God wants us to understand through Moses is that Seth had something God never intended for Seth to have, and that it, he carried the sin nature of his father, Adam. That, that because of the fall, now we're all still created in God's image, but because of the fall, Seth was going to deal with something uh, that we all deal with, and that is a sin nature that's given to us through Adam and through the line of men ever since. He inherited that from his father. That's why you don't have to teach kids how to sin. Nobody goes up to a child and says, let me teach you how to sass your parents. Nobody goes up to a child and says, let me teach you how to be selfish or to say the word no. Why? Because we're born with that sin nature. We're born with that rebellion that's in us. It comes naturally because we are born with the likeness of Adam, spiritually separated from God with a natural inclination to sin. It's why Jesus had to be born of a virgin. Because the sin nature is not passed down by the mother, it's passed down by the father. And so Jesus couldn't have a biological father because that sin nature would have been passed down to him. So why is life so hard and painful? Because of a choice that Adam made to rebel against God. And, and that's why this series is so important, because when we understand that, we start to understand the world that we live in and why it's so hard. Now, when you look at this verse again, 
Here's something really interesting. He's got this son, Seth, and why does he have this son, Seth? Well, when Adam and Eve leave the garden, they have two boys, Cain and Abel. When those boys got old enough, they started to bring their offerings to God. And the Bible said that there was a day where Abel brought his offering to God. It was the first of his flock. He, he raised animals, and he brought the first of his flock to God as an offering. It's the principle of the first fruits, that we're to give the first 10% to God. Really was a lot more powerful when people didn't have savings accounts, and they were day laborers. They would give the first of their fruit to God and saying, God, I trust you that you're going to supply the other 90%. And so that's the biblical principle of first fruits. So, um, so Abel brought his first fruits to God as an act of worship. The Bible said that Cain brought an offering. It wasn't his first fruits. It was just something he had left over. And so God comes and he accepts Abel's offering and he rejects Cain's offering. And Cain gets mad so mad and so angry that he kills Abel. And so now, sin has affected the world so much that in the first generation, a brother kills a brother over jealousy and anger. But I don't know if you've ever thought about this part of it. When Adam was burying his son Abel, and Adam was laying him in the ground, all Adam could think about was, I did that. That's not God's plan. That's not the way it was supposed to be. It's only because of a choice I made in the garden that my son is being buried today. And Adam had to deal with the pain of that decision. And here's what I would say to all of us. In our lives, much of the pain that we go through is because of decisions we have to trust in ourselves and not in God, to do things our way instead of God's way, to listen to the voice of culture instead of the voice of God's word. And we deal with pain in our lives, not just because of Adam, but because we continue to listen to the lie like Adam did. And then there's a verse there of, in your notes, Genesis 5, 28 and 29. And you're going down the line, and it said, Lamech was 182 years old when he fathered a son, and he named him Noah, saying, This one will bring us relief from the agonizing labor of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. If we were to continue reading in Genesis 3 and 4, here's what we discover. Because of sin... There's a curse that happens. The first curse was God looks at the serpent and says, you are now going to be on your belly through the dust the rest of your days. So if his curse is now you're going to slither in the dust on your belly, that kind of points to the fact that beforehand he probably had arms and legs and feet and hands. But because of the curse now, he's going, to, and by the way, God says, and there's going to be this hatred between women and you. Then he goes to Eve and he says, now here's the curse for you. Because you chose to do this, you're going to have pain in childbearing. So women, that's why. And I've been at the birth of two of my sons, and let me just say, props to you women. Thank you, Lord, that that's the way that went, all right? So, you know, if you're nine months pregnant, you go into labor, just blame Eve. It's all about that, all right? So then he turns to Adam and says, by the way, man, you're just not going to be able to go pick fruit. You're going to have to work for your food. And the ground's going to be hard, and it's going to be labor to work for your food. Now, even though those are two very specific curses, I think they're also symbolic. I think what God is saying, guess what, guys? The world's going to be hard, and it's going to be painful. And it's all because of a choice to rebel against God's perfect plan for our lives. And so there's not only pain in ourselves, but there's pain now that's spread throughout humanity. Everybody feels the effect 
of Adam's sin, and our culture deals with the effect of a fallen world. And look at how bad it got really quick. Genesis 6, 5. Understand this, 1,600 years between Adam and Noah. And look what happened in those 1,600 years. You went from paradise to this. When the Lord saw that the human wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time. Every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time. That's how much sin infected the world. From paradise to every inclination of, of wickedness all the time in 1,600 years. And it's why we feel pain in the world today. Remember, God's plan was not what we have today. God's plan was paradise. In the garden, there was no cancer. In the garden, there was no natural disasters. In the garden, you didn't have to deal with somebody who hurts you. All of that is a result of man's rebellion against God. And not only is there pain in humanity, but also God felt the pain of our rebellion. And I say our rebellion because Adam's sin is all of our sin. And look at how much what, what God said in Genesis 6 6. It says that the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth. And he was deeply grieved. Why was he grieved? Because his creation has been destroyed by sin. He's grieved because he knew the pain that Adam and Eve were going to go through. He was grieved because he knew how depraved the mind of man would get as they listened to the lie of Satan. He was also grieved because he knew how costly it would be for him. See, Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 tells us this, said, just as sin came in the world through one man, Adam, now life can be found through one man, Jesus. And the Bible calls Jesus a second Adam. And think about this. Adam was tempted in the garden, and Adam immediately gave in. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Three of those temptations are recorded in Scripture. And he never gave in. He constantly answered the accusations with God's word. And he resisted the temptations of Satan. Adam and Eve took fruit from a tree and death came to the world. Jesus willingly climbed a tree and died so that life could be found in him. Adam and Eve were naked and shameful, and God had to kill an animal to clothe them so that their shame would be covered. Jesus, the Lamb of God, was slain so that we could be clothed in the righteousness of God. And the second Adam had to come because of Genesis 3. But the good news for us is that because the second Adam came, we can be released of the curse that was found in the garden. That, that to put our faith in Christ means that we can be reconciled to God, that our sin can be covered, and that we can live victoriously with him. Doesn't mean we still don't deal with the effects of the fall. It will be here as long as we're here or until Jesus brings the new earth. We're going to deal with the effects of the fall. But we can have victory over the fall. And it doesn't mean just believing in God. Listen, Satan believes in God more than anybody in this room. It doesn't mean believing in God. It means surrendering to God. And Jesus said, put your faith in me. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's through me that we find, through Jesus, that we find eternal life, that we find forgiveness of sins. It's through Jesus Christ that, that we find hope in this life. In fact, 
here's what we know. The Bible says greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. You can actually have victory over that sin that has control of your life through Jesus Christ. But it doesn't come by acknowledging God. It comes by surrendering to God. The question is today, have you ever had a moment in your life where you said, yes, I know that I've surrendered my life to Christ and and that he is my way, that he's my way maker and it's through him that I find life. Or even if you are a believer, there can be areas of your life where you believe the lie and Satan has control and, and we call it a stronghold and it's a sin you don't think you can overcome. Well, that's just a lie. God says his power is greater than anything Satan can throw out and it's just trust him. And so because of the lie, we have marriages are in trouble. Because of the lie, we have people who, who isolate themselves. Because of the lie, we have murder, hatred. It's to get back to the garden and understand God's intent that comes through Jesus Christ. So this morning, I hope you know the way maker. If not, you can find your way even this morning. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. There's nothing to keep you from putting your faith in him. Just a minute, we're gonna stand, we're gonna worship, and we're gonna have some of our deacons, their wives here. And this morning, if you'd like to find that way, you can come and they'll help you take that step. Or maybe you're here and you're saying, man, I know I'm a believer, I know I'm going to heaven, but there's an area, a stronghold in my life. You don't have to tell them what it is, just say, would you pray for me in this area? Just pray for me. Maybe you're here and you know somebody who, man, at one time they were walking with the Lord, but they've lost their way and you want to intercede and pray for them. Or or maybe it's somebody who's never given their life to Christ. There's power when two or more come together in prayer. And so we're going to worship and we're going to pray and ask God to be our way. Let's all stand. Let me pray. And then we're going to sing. Father God, thank you. That after the fall, Lord, you didn't give up on us, but you made a way. And that way came at the cost of your son, Jesus. But God, the second Adam has brought life if we will trust him. And we just pray this morning that you would guide us as we respond. And that God, we really would trust you as the way, the truth, and the life. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.